on the national question. Uh, uh, in around 1964 or thereabouts, the RNA began to buy up land in Mississippi. And uh, it was part of them implementing their program, which was for a black nation, a separate black nation. And, and the party, our party, uh, got into a struggle with the entire political movement of uh, RNA, Malcolm X, everybody, you know, and the, on the basis of the right to self-determination, especially when the chairman of our party, Sam Marcy, introduced the idea in 1961, November, actually, to our party. It wasn't introduced to the black masses, but to our party, because the tradition in the communist movement in the United States was fight racism. Black and white, united and fight, that was the end of it. It was progressive, don't get me wrong. But then came the question of self-determination. And that's when the party embraced it. And it based itself on Lenin's strategic position, which was that there couldn't be a revolution in Russia until we reached out and brought the oppressed nations. This was the prison house of nations in Russia. And it was part of the class struggle and victorious class struggle that Lenin uh, uh, elaborated the conception of workers and oppressed uniting in the revolutionary struggle. And that's when they set up the uh, Congress of Nationalities in the USSR. There were two Congresses. <laughs> there was the Soviet, that was everything. It was uh, People were elected from the factories and so on. But there was also the Congress of Nationalities in which each oppre formerly oppressed nation had delegates and it had equal status with the Soviet that was based more on factories and so on. So it was national and class. And that died in the movement. It died <laughs> under Stalin, but we'll let that go for the moment. And Sam brought it back up. Harry Hayward actually brought it back up within the Communist Party. He, I think he, he got kicked out on account of that, to some extent. And, and I remember coming in the party and being handed a book by Harry Hayward. <laughs> but, but, uh, it, no, but he had a little pamphlet. Uh, I, I forgot the name of it, but it was about the national question uh, and the right of self-determination. And so when the RNA began to buy up land, the state attacked them. Arm attack on them. Right? Remember that? Yeah. And they had a branch in Cleveland, Ohio. There was a section of the RNA in Cleveland, Ohio. And as part of the repression in Mississippi, they attacked the RNA in Cleveland, Ohio. And one of the founding members of our party, a steelworker by the name of Ted Dostal, organized a small contingent and went down when there was gunfire going back and forth between the police and the RNA in their headquarters to try to defend them. He got busted and spent six months in the workhouse at the age of 65. And that was us up, That was us on the question of the right of self-determination, and we still stand for that. And if something happens in Jackson, the party's going to do it again, only bigger, whatever's necessary. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, the um, car wash workers, L Lagon, I can't remember the name. It's a chain. And it's, uh, RW, it's the retail wholesale and district uh, department store workers who are organizing them uh, together with the walk, the whatever it is, make the road by walking. But the union is behind it. And uh, the, they were fired, some of the workers were fired to break the union. And uh, they got them back, and then the company shut the place down. They have a number of them. The company shut the, the car wash down. And they, they got 
sued for unfair labor practices, and I think that it made its way up to the Attorney General, and he overruled the company, and they had to put the workers back. Is that right? I think so, yeah. Now, th th that's interesting because the, of all the unions, one of the most active among low-wage workers is the retail, wholesale, and department store workers. They're beginning to organize H&M, and, uh, and clothing, uh, clothing sales, you know, companies that sell clothes in the Midtown area. And uh, those are low-wage workers. Uh, and grocery, too, oh, in the boroughs, too. And so this is a very important thing, to pay attention to the RWDSU uh, union. And it's an example, and they're being successful in many cases. So. It's a under the, see the bushes. They don't tell you anything. They keep it a secret. You know the seven day walk out, the walk out by the uh, in the seven cities. That's an event. It's a it's a sort of a, a news event, and it comes and goes, and they don't feel a terrible threat from it actually, but they do feel a threat from going into the ground and organizing the workers into an actual collective bargaining situation where they can limit the bosses. That, they don't want to publicize that. And that's going on all over the place. These other low-wage strikes are more or less, uh, they're important, very important, symbolic, but important as a sign of the willingness of workers to take risk. You know, if you're making $8.25 an hour, you're pretty desperate. You lose your job, you're in trouble. To be able to be willing to go out on the street and protest and have your picture taken and everybody knows, and you know the company got its spies there, they know everybody who's there by name. And you can be subject to, as soon as you walk in, you can be thrown out but they may wait a while because they're legally subject. So they'll wait a while until there's a certain t passage of time and they can't be accused of unfair labor practice and they'll trump you up something and they'll frame you up and fire you. So the workers, th th doing this in the face of that is, is something that we need to, to pay attention to. And by the way, most of these workers are black and Latin. And a lot of them are women, because th they are the ones who are most uh, first pushed into these these jobs. And so it's part of the class struggle and the national struggle sort of merge over here. So anyway, that's it for me.